continue our treatment of genetics. And as we've said, genetics really is the study of information flow within biological systems. And we, and we talk about the information flow between genera generations, either between cell generations or between uh, organismal generations. We're talking about transmission genetics, and it's that that we've been talking about for the past few weeks. But now it's time to move on and talk about molecular genetics that describes the flow of information within organisms or cells. And that is the encoding of information in DNA and the decoding of that information to govern cell function and structure. So let's now move on to molecular genetics. And molecular genetics was really born with the um, solving of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. You've seen this picture before. This is a the DNA that has been spilled out of a chromosomal scaffold uh, showing that, that each chromosome, each chromatid in this case, consists of one lo very, very long stretch of DNA, one long DNA molecule. Very thin, but very, very, very long. So let's talk about this in a historical context initially and talk about the discovery that DNA was in fact the genetic material. Um, and the for a long time, uh, it was thought that DNA was too simple a molecule to be uh, the carrier of genetic information, that there, there must be more complex molecules. And DNA was known to be fairly simple in that it contained only four different types of monomers, uh, monomers that contained four different nitrogenous bases, A, T, G, or C, adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine. And proteins having 20 different amino acids were thought to be much more likely carriers of genetic information. But there were some uh, in very interesting experiments done by, in, way back in the 1920s by uh, a man named Griffith, uh, um, an investigator who was studying bacterial infections of mammals. And he was studying bacterium called S. pneumoniae. And what Griffith observed was that his strains of S. pneumoniae that he would grow in his laboratory could be injected intraperitoneally in mice and the mice would die. That is, the, the bacteria were quite virulent. They would mount a, a, a very virulent infection and actually kill the mouse. And when Griffith uh, grew these types of bacteria in petri dishes and formed colonies, let's try that one again, but when he drew these in petri dishes, try to make a rounder petri dish here, the colonies would form very nice smooth colonies in a petri dish. So there were actually two phenotypes to the strains of bacteria that Griffith started working with. The one phenotype was that when grown in petri dishes, the colonies of bacteria, each one started from a single bacterium, which would, would then grow into a colony, those colonies had a smooth appearance. So these were called S, an S strain of bacteria. And S cells were also, the smooth cells were also virulent. V stands for virulent in that they would mount an infection and kill mice. Well, Griffith obtained a strain of, of uh, observed one day that he had a mute mutation or apparent mutation in one of his colonies that most of the colonies were smooth that he would grow but one day he observed that there was a rough colony that grew from a particular single bacterium and gave rise to a colony that was rough it had a rough appearance these were called R for rough these rough bacteria when isolated and grown up and injected into mice wouldn't actually not kill the mice. The mice would mount an immune response to the infection and be able to fight these rough bacteria off. Well, we now know what the basis of both these phenotypes are. So the rough bacteria were non-virulent. NV stands for non-virulent in that they would not kill mice. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there were two phenotypes that we're talking about here, smooth and virulent, smooth or virulent, or rough and non-virulent. And we now know the basis of this in that the smooth bacteria 
contain a polysaccharide coat, a sugar coat in other words. Polysaccharide is a, polysaccharides are polymers of sugars, of, of sugar monomers. <coughs> and the, the smooth bacteria have a polysaccharide coat that protects them from the immune response of, of mammals, in this case the mice. And so the bacteria are protected by their polysaccharide coat by the, from attack by the immune system and they would kill the mice. So the polysaccharide coat that gives the smooth appearance when grown in colonies on a petri dish also allows the bacteria to escape immune surveillance by the mammalian immune system and therefore we have a virulent phenotype. Whereas there's a mutation in the S, the mutation which causes the S to R change in phenotype on, on petri dishes also renders the rough bacteria non-virulent. And that is because they lack a polysaccharide coat. The mutation causes uh, a change in the ability to synthesize a polysaccharide coat. The rough mutation does. And therefore, when injected into mice, the, mo the mouse immune system is able to recognize the bacteria because it's not protected by a polysaccharide coat. And the proteins on the cell surface are recognized by the immune system and the mouse is able to mount a successful immune response and fight off the infection and live and be happy. So this was very interesting in that uh, what Griffith had on his hands was a rough, or a smooth to rough mutation. This was a mutation and it was heritable. That is, whatever had been changed, causing these changes in phenotypes, both grow, the phenotype grown in petri dishes and the virulence phenotype to non-virulent, the mutation had changed the genetic material because this was heritable. You could take these bacteria and grow them on a new petri dish and they would, the colonies derived from there would all be rough. So this was a genetic mutation, and whatever had been changed was a change in the genetic material because this could be passed on from cell generation to cell generation. And of course, all these rough colonies when grown and then injected into mice would still allow the mice to live. Well, Griffith made a very interesting observation, and that was he took he took, S, uh, he took smooth cells that were normally virulent, but he uh, grew them in liquid culture and then boiled them. Basically, heat killed them. And that killed the bacteria such that when injected, these heat killed um, extracts, if you will, of bacteria, when injected into the mouse, allowed the mouse to live. They were, that is, they were rendered, these S cells, which were normally virulent, were rendered non-virulent by heat treatment. So something had been killed, the bacteria had been killed and were unable to mount an infection in the mouse. But if our cells, I'm sorry, if, if our cells here, which lack a polysa polysaccharide coat and are therefore non-virulent, were mixed with heat-killed S extracts that, that were, came from the heat-killed S cells, so these were mixed together, uh, and allowed to um, intermingle, let's say, in a flask. So these were mixed together and allowed to intermingle. And then this mixture was injected into mice. We had restored virulence. Neither of these alone, heat-killed S cells or R cells, were, are, were capable of killing the mouse. Or, uh, they were incapable of mounting a virulent attack, this case or this case. But when mixed together, they were able to kill the, kill the mice. They were able to mount a virulent attack. So the um, bacteria that were obtained from the mouse, the dead mouse then, and grown in petri dishes, were all observed to have now a smooth phenotype, not a rough phenotype. And of course, if you tried to obtain bacteria in this case, the, there were, the bacteria were nothing would grow because they had all been killed by the immune system of the mouse. But here, the, the bacteria that were derived from the dead mouse were all of the smooth phenotype. And when these cells were grown again, say cells from a single colony, there was a heritable change. They were all smooth. Furthermore, any of these colonies when grown up and injected into a mouse would kill the mouse. There's a little mouse. So if these were injected into a mouse, rest in peace, the mouse would die. 
So what had happened here by mixing the heat killed extracts of S cells with R cells is that R cells had been transformed back into S cells. And this process was called transformation. And this transformation, as I've just said, was heritable. That was a permanent change that could be passed on from cell generation to generation. And so it was immediately realized that what had happened was that the R cells had picked up something when they were incubated with the heat killed S cells. They had picked up something that had caused their transformation into S cells. And whatever it was that the R cells had picked up must be the stuff of genes. It must be genetic material because it had caused the heritable change of phenotypes from R to S and from non-virulent to virulent. So both phenotypes had, had, um, had been induced in the R cells in their transformation, in the process of transformation. So they had picked up the gen genetic material, whatever that was, from the heat killed extracts. And Avery McCarty and Cloud in the 1940s realized that they could take, if they could isolate from the heat killed extracts, whatever it was that was transforming the R cells into S cells, they would have the molecule of genes. They would have the molecule that was the genetic material. And basically what Avery McCarty and McCloud established was that the transforming principle, so the transforming, they called it the transforming principle. That is, whatever it was that would transform R cells into S cells and that was picked up by the heat killed S cell extracts, whatever the transforming principle was, was the genetic material, was the stuff of genes because it had caused a permanent change in, in both the virulence phenotype and the, uh, the growth phenotype on Petri dishes. And Avery McCarty and McLeod Avery McCarty and McLeod went after biochemically whatever the transforming principle was. They wanted to discover what that, how that transforming principle behaved molecularly speaking or biochemically speaking. And they subjected then, they took the heat killed extracts of S cells and treated that in various ways. So they would treat that with various enzymes that would degrade proteins or that would degrade DNA. And what they found was that biochemically speaking, the transforming principle, they could knock out the ability to transform by treating with enzymes that would digest DNA. But if they treated with enzymes that would digest protein, for example, they would not knock out the transforming principle. That is, if they treated the heat killed extracts, the heat killed S extracts, with enzyme preparations that would digest protein, the transforming principle was intact. That is, the, um, the, the heat killed extract so treated could still, when incubated with R cells, cause their transformation to S cells. Whereas, if they treated the heat killed S extracts with enzyme preparations that would digest or break down DNA, the transforming principle was knocked out. That is, the heat killed extracts so treated with enzyme preps that would uh, break down DNA were no longer capable when mixed with R cells of transforming them into S cells. And these observations plus other biochemical observations that showed that the transforming principle behaved as DNA when sedimented in centrifugation uh, treatments and other properties of the transforming principle led to the inescapable, almost inescapable con conclusion that DNA, in fact, equaled the transforming principle. That is that DNA then was the stuff of genes. Now, despite these elegant experiments, which showed that DNA uh, really was uh, the molecule that was uh, that caused heredity, that caused this uh, genetic transformation, uh, the notion that genes were the genetic material wasn't fully accepted until 
uh, experimenters working with bacteriophage, bacterial viruses, showed that the same um, the features of DNA held true in these organisms. So what we have here are little bacterial viruses called bacteriophage, or phage for short. Phage uh, comes from phagos Greek, meaning to eat. So bacteriophage are eaters of bacteria. They are bacterial viruses that bind to bacteria, inject their genetic material, whatever that is, and mount an infection inside the bacteria and produce more progeny viruses in this process. And then those progeny viruses are released by the bacteria. Well, Hershey and Chase um, uh, were studying bacteriophage and they had ways to label the uh, different molecules found in bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are very simple organisms. They contain a protein coat, which has a head and a, um, a kind of a capsule uh, made out of protein and a uh, neck made out of protein and tail fibers that are made out of protein. And within this protein head, there is, the, there is DNA. DNA is found inside the, the uh, head of the uh, bacteriophage. And what Hershey and Chase did was to differentially label the DNA on one hand or the protein of the bacteriophage on the other hand. So we know that sulfur is found in proteins. The amino acids in proteins that contain sulfur are cysteine and methionine. But DNA does not contain sulfur, and this was known at the time. Whereas we know that DNA, in fact, does contain phosphorus, the uh, phosphorus atom in the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. But, did, but DNA does not contain sulfur. So by using two radioactive isotopes as tags, they could grow the bacteriophage either in the presence of, of radioactive sulfur, S35, in which case the bacteriophage grown in the medium on, on bacteria with, and the medium containing S35 would uh, be released and their protein coats would be labeled with radioactive sulfur. But on the other hand, phage, bacteriophage that were grown in the presence of radioactive phosphorus would contain that phosphorus in their DNA. And so they would be labeled then, their DNA would be labeled in a way that could be followed. Whereas here the, the proteins are labeled in a way which can be followed. And then what they, what Hershey and Chase did was to conduct a famous wearing blender experiment. In both of these uh, cases, they would take phage differentially labeled, here protein, here DNA, and they would infect bacteria with them. But they would only allow the infection to proceed for a short time, just enough time for the bacteriophage to get whatever molecule that is responsible for directing the infection of the bacteria, that is just enough time to get their genetic material, whatever that was, into the bacterium. They would mount an infection for a short period of time and then they would take the, the uh, growth medium which, in which these infections were being mounted and they would shear the bacteriophage off of the bacteria by, by um, uh, by blending this in a high-speed blender that would cause shear forces that would, would uh, remove the bacteriophage from the surface of the bacteria. And then they could take their, um, their, their growth cultures that were so treated that had been subjected to sev uh, severe shear forces, and they could put those in test tubes and centrifuge them at fairly high speed. And because the bacteria are, have much greater mass than the phage that would be released by the shear forces, the bacteria pellet to the bottom of the test tubes in the centrifuge, whereas the bacteriophage that are released by shearing remain in the supernatant. So we have the, the, the bacteriophage particles that uh, were sheared off the surface of the bacteria a short time after infection in the supernatant in both of these cases, and the pellet contains the bacteria. And the question was, what were the bacteriophage, what molecule were the bacteriophage um, passing on to the bacteria that would mount the bacteriophage infection? That is, what molecule uh, was responsible for directing the propagation of the bacteriophage? That is, what molecule was in fact the genetic material? And in this case, when they labeled the protein coats 
of the phage prior to infection. They found that their S35 label was predominantly found in the supernatant, suggesting that the labeled protein remained with the bacteriophage that had been sheared off shortly after infection. However, in the phage that had been, had their DNA labeled with radioactive phosphorus, the radioactive phosphorus label after this experiment was conducted was found in the pellet that that is it had the radioactive phosphorus, the DNA in other words, of the bacteriophage had pelleted with the bacteria that had been um, produced by shearing off the bacteriophage from their surface. And this led to the somewhat inescapable conclusion then that the what the bacteriophage were injecting into the bacteria was the genetic material, and that genetic material was in fact DNA because that the DNA label showed up with the bacteria and the, in the bacterial pellet and not with the bacteriophage in the supernatant of their experiments. And this then uh, the, uh, kind of uh, put the nail in the coffin of the idea that proteins could be the genetic material and actually gave very strong support to the notion that DNA was in fact the genetic material. And given that, uh, a, a race soon ensued uh, between several labs in England that were very interested in finding out what the structure of DNA was in cells, the in vivo structure of DNA. Uh, certain features of DNA structure were known, but uh, the, uh, the actual structure of DNA in cells was unknown. And what we're going to talk about in the next part of this lecture then is the uh, race to discover the structure of DNA and um, we'll then enter into a detailed description of uh, DNA structure. <laughs>